Welcome to Down to Earth Astrology and Primal Girl Wellness. This is Miss Jenny and I am your astrologer. Today, uh, the well yesterday, the trial for Kyle Rittenhouse started. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is the shooter who attempted to massacre protesters um, at a Black Lives Matter protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This is the same kid whose mother drove him across state lines while he was carrying an AK-47 knowing full well what he was intending to do um, because apparently she was encouraging and supporting this yay toxic motherhood um so in any event the the jury was selected yesterday the trial starts today and i wanted to see how this was going to go um in terms of verdicts right and i just want to give you guys a caveat i don't typically or ever do legal stuff in a chart um i just don't and the other is that this is all, you know, speculation until proven otherwise, you know, or proven right. So we're going to take a look at the chart for the trial uh, when it started or when the jury, the official announcement had been made that the final jury selection uh, had been made and approved, which was last night. We're going to look at the date and time of the shooting in Kenosha, Washington, w Wisconsin. Um, and we're also going to look at Kyle Rittenhouse's chart. Um, so we're going to see what kind of information we can glean from these things, um, and see what astrology can and can't tell us. Let's begin. All right. So we're going to start, we're going to kind of work backwards here. So we're going to start with the trial and then work back to Kyle's natal chart. So the first slide is the Kyle Rittenhouse trial that officially started last night as soon as jury, jury selection was done and approved. And that was 7 p.m. November 1st, 2021 in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This is the chart for the trial. Um, and by the way, the, this picture down here in the corner, I, I don't know why this is suddenly appearing in my slideshow and I'm not completely sure how to get rid of it. And I don't have a lot of time. So <laughs> we're just going to kind of work with it. Sorry. Okay. So um, I am not that familiar with working with legal charts or trial charts. So I am doing my best educated guess as to what belongs where, and we will certainly see how these things play out. So the first and the seventh house in the chart, let me get my little thing here. There we go. The first and the seventh house in the chart typically represent self versus other. So in a trial, um, we would have the defendant versus the prosecution. Um, and I don't, I, I would assume that the first house is the prosecution, the person making the action, and the seventh house is the defendant or the person defending themselves. Um, it could be backwards. I don't know. I, we'll see. But the more important thing, though, is the aspects, right? Because I want you to see this. So if we look here, let me get this right there. Jupiter is the seventh house. Mercury is the first. They're in trine aspect to each other. Now, um, if we were doing a trial for an innocent man being convicted, this would be a very different conversation, but that is not the case here. Um, we are dealing with somebody who is literally was recorded and caught gun, like smoking gun in hand firing on innocent protesters that had no relationship to him and weren't even near him. So there was no, he's a murderer. So the first and the seventh house are the, the prosecutor or the prosecution and the defense being in trying or easy aspect with each other is not a good sign because right there it appears that the decision has already been made before the trial ever starts. So as the old saying goes, the fix is in. This is not uh, something that makes me very happy to see. So it would appear uh, that that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is if you look over here in the seventh house, we've got Venus, which is a beneficial or beneficent star in the seventh house. It's in Sagittarius, which means it's disposited by the ruler of its house, uh, Jupiter, right? So that right there, and it's in sextile of Jupiter. So that right there, again, gives a strong indication that there is something favorable that has happened prior to the trial now. So there's been a whole lot of stuff happening before this ever got into the courtroom that is of benefit 
to the defendant if the seventh house is the defendant. Now, if it's the prosecution, obviously these are things that are working to the prosecution's advantage. We'll know when the trial is over which one is which. So now we're going to look at the ninth house and also keep in mind this is a jury trial. We're going to look at the ninth house for legal processes and the law itself, the you know the higher order of society, right? The law. So right here we've got Pluto and Saturn. Saturn is near the top of this chart and Saturn is making a trine to the moon. Mm. Uh, it's also making some squares here uh, to the Sun and Mars. So what this, in brief, what this might be telling us is that with Saturn uh, very, and ruling the ninth at the top of the chart on the, on the Midhaven, it could indicate that the legalities of this particular case and how this plays out legally uh, is going to be very high profile or very important for setting a precedent, right, for other people coming after this. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so maybe you know somebody who studies law that understands why this is so potent or important. Now, with that moon training Saturn and the moon coming into fifth house, the, the moon in the fifth house represents the populace or the people. It can it can also theoretically represent the jury, right, Or because it's the, the population, the general everyday flux of people. With a moon in the fifth house, this would indicate that there's this feeling that this is everybody's son, right? So there, there's a, a perception bias that works in favor, <laughs> I hate to say this, but works in favor of um, possibly the defendant um, because they may see him as one of their own. And typically a jury is supposed to be a much more diverse, not emotionally invested group of people, but there's some weird stuff coming out of the, the mouths of the judge um, and some other people. And Wisconsin is not known for its very diverse or educated population. So uh, yeah, um, we've, we've already got some hurdles that we're having to get over here if we're gonna get a fair trial for what is obviously murder and attempted murder. So there's that. Now, this Saturn, remember Saturn also squares that Sun Mars. So the Sun Mars in the sixth, Squaring Saturn, ruling the ninth, conjuncting the Midhaven also suggests that um, technicalities, and it's the law, it's always a technicality, right? But technicalities and also very specifically procedure and the letter of the law are going to be very important. And there's a lot of pressure being applied here. There is the possibility that this may end up being a mistrial or get um, challenged later on procedural mistakes or issues. And the reason I say that is because the Sun and Mars are both in Scorpio as it squares that Saturn in Aquarius. And Sun and Mars together in Scorpio, they're not close enough to be conjunct, thank God. But Mars and Scorpio and Sun and Scorpio are both behind the scenes, smoke and you know backroom deals kind of thing going on. And again, everything we've seen prior to this aspect has indicated there's been a whole lot of stuff that's already been decided before this ever came to trial. So literally the fix is in, the decision has been made, they're literally just going through the formalities like the dog and pony show to satisfy the public. Mm, right? Okay. Now, Pluto is also part of this ninth house configuration, which is about the law and the, the application of law, right? So Pluto's been in Capricorn for a very long time and it has been problematic uh, for everybody because Pluto represents upheaval and gross or large scale change. Powerful, deep, transformative change. We're, we're all going through it and it's never neat and clean. It's always messy. Now, this Pluto appearing in the ninth house, and again, this represents things that impact the masses. So something about this case is gonna have very, very significant portent and impact on large groups of people moving forward. So it's not just about this kid, it's about everybody and anybody that would use this case as a precedent in the future, right? Because this will be a role model for other things, which is very ominous. Now, Mercury, which we think rules the prosecution. Um, I think rules the prosecution. It could be the defense. Um, but if it is in fact, the first house is the prosecution, the person taking the action, that means that the prosecution is ruled by Mercury. Mercury is squaring Pluto in the ninth from the sixth. So 
This could also indicate some serious pushback, resistance, or obstacles in terms of the prosecution getting what it needs to get done done. So there may be a lot of interference and a lot of um, manipulation, right? Deliberate, deliberate interference with the prosecution getting what it, what it wants. Now, Mercury is conjunct the fixed star Spica. Um, it's between Spica and Arcturus, which is a very beneficial fixed star. So what that also suggests that there's some success here, but more than that, there's, um, there's more than a little bit of fame and recognition that comes with being part of this first house group. So if it is the prosecution, the people on the prosecution team can expect to get uh, a serious leg up professionally or some accolades or praise, some benefit, some success and benefit from being part of our prosecution team even though we have Pluto here in the ninth deliberately uh, obstructing and interfering with things. I'm going to bet you good money that there's going to be issues with technicalities that are going to prevent this from going forward. Um, and I'm not completely sure that this is accidental. I think some of these technicalities and these mistakes that are being made are deliberate. And not because of sabotage, but because of agreements that were made before they went into trial. Because the trial at this point, from what I'm seeing here, it looks like literally just theatrics. Literally just a dog and pony show to make everybody happy. Wow. Okay. I'm not cynical. I'm not cynical. I'm trying. I'm trying not to be cynical. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> okay. So the seventh house uh, is ruled by Jupiter. And we. Th I think that the seventh house is the defendant, which would be Kyle himself. Jupiter is in the 10th house, which is going to make whoever the seventh house is presented by as extremely high profile. And also with Jupiter and Aquarius, very popular, um, not necessarily with the masses, but certainly with, with groups of people who have very specific ideas about how the world works, right? Because Aquarius is very much about like-minded people based on principles. And, you know, Aquarius also rules the, the fringe element. Right? It can also rule geniuses, you know, and like the gifted and talented kids in school. Aquarius can rule a lot of things. But ultimately here, this seventh house rulership, the seventh house is now a poster child or a, a visible symbol or an icon representing something that makes him very popular with fringe elements, people who represent um, a, a group, a group of people who are not the norm are, and are exceptional in their presentation in some way or manner. And I mean exceptional, meaning they're very different, not that they're very great. So literally you could have, um, with Aquarius, when we talk about exceptional groups of people or people who represent exceptional types, we could be referring to anything from, you know, the Mensa High IQ Society to the Moonies that follow Reverend Sun Young Moon, you know, to uh, the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> so Aquarius can represent a lot of things, but ultimately what it does represent it are groups of people who are joined together by some type of principle or philosophy that are way out on the fringe. They don't represent the mainstream. Okay, so that's important to know as well. So um, the good news is that the seventh house, if this is in fact the defendant or Kyle, makes him extremely popular with uh, groups of unusual people. So somebody loves him, God bless. Okay. Now, the other thing, when we look at this chart, we've got a T-square here. So the Sun and Uranus and Saturn are in T-square. Now it's kind of a wide T-square because the Sun has moved away from Saturn. It's moving into an opposition with Uranus um, and they're all separated by a few degrees. So it's not tight and some of this is separating. The only applying aspect in this chart is the Sun Uranus. Now that Sun Uranus uh, is separated by three so maybe three and these are fixed signs so i would say three weeks i don't think this trial is going to go on for three months i think it's going to be very very fast um and the other reason i think it's going to be very fast is because the moon is in a cardinal air sign and i'm pretty sure the moon is moving fast today um and the moon's first applying aspect is to Saturn, which rules the 10th house as well as the 9th, which is going to bring this to some type of closure completion um, without having to go through all the other aspects first. So with that sun opposing Uranus as, as the, the applying aspect in this T-square, I would expect this, and it's in fixed signs, I would expect this to uh, come to some type of climax in either three 
days, which is pretty fast, um, or three weeks, um, but certainly no longer than three months. This will not, this will not go three months. Um, and also, too, here's what's interesting. So that Sun Uranus opposition here indicates uh, some type of break uh, or disruption or unexpected, well, unexpected if you're not an astrologer, unexpected turn of events. Um, that could just literally bring things to a grinding halt, you know, or screeching halt, I should say. So again, um, just, and I'm, I could be wrong, but I'm going to put this out here from what I'm seeing the way I'm reading this chart, this appears to be that Kyle Rittenhouse is not going to go to prison and he may actually get off on a technicality, or if he does get charged with murder, they're going to challenge it. And again, uh, it's going to get some, something's going to break or interfere with this and they're going to have to redo it. Um, now, with the Sun Uranus opposition with his T square, there's also a lot of pressure. And because the Saturn in his T square, right, the Saturn in the T square is at the top of this chart. So there's a lot of public pressure because the Midhaven is the public. There's a lot of public pressure for this to be done right. Like this has to be airtight, which doesn't make any sense when you consider the fact that we've got this kid on film. We have video documentation and multiple witnesses you know, about him shooting these people. There's no question what happened. I mean, unless you're smoking crack and you're on like some kind of Alice in Wonderland acid trip, we all know what happened. So why this would need to be airtight doesn't make any sense. The case in and of itself should be open and shut. I don't know how this works. So let's, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that we all keep an eye on this to see how this plays out because there's there's tricky stuff happening here. A lot of stuff was decided before they walked into the court. There's a lot of pressure to get it right and to make it airtight. But again, technicalities or, or miscalculations and certainly things coming out of left field um, that are gonna be very disruptive are expected to break or bring this thing to a screeching halt because um, it will not go forward in a straightforward manner. So we'll see, we'll see. Okay, so that is that is my prediction for this trial. Now the next chart we're looking at is the Kenosha, Wisconsin Black Lives Matter protest murders. And these are murders. I don't care what you want to call it, the boy murdered people. These are murders. This occurred on August 25th, 2020. And according to news documents, uh, the shooting occurred at 11.48 p.m. For those of you who wanna set up your charts at home and take a look. Okay, so a couple of things. We don't actually have Kyle Rittenhouse's time of birth, so we don't know what houses his planets are falling in. So what we have on the inside is the time and date and place for the shooting itself. On the outside, we have Kyle's planets. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to see if there's anything here that's been activated, uh, that has activated his chart, right? What might have triggered his chart that led to this type of action, you know, other than his mother's encouragement, support, and, you know, enabling of it by driving him there. Oh God, what a mother. Anyway, <laughs> oh man. So there are people who love to pull up like charts for every disaster the moment it happens. What earthquake? Pull up a chart. What tornado? Pull up a chart. What mass shooting? Pull up a chart. Um, what the, you know, miscarriage? Pull up a chart. So I, I don't understand it. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I do not understand it because you what possible information can you get out of this that will prevent it from happening in the future, right? Um, however, I, I do believe that we can take these charts and we can, we can superimpose them on a person, like in this case, because we have an active shooter murderer uh, that we know has done this and we know the time it happened. We can put it against their chart to see what is showing up by transits that may have been facilitating or contributing to this action. So when we're looking at the chart, again, inside it's the shooting itself, outsiders planets, because we don't know what time he was born. Okay, so a couple of things I want you guys to notice about this chart um, <laughs> right at the top. So on the evening of the murders, right, we had a quarter moon in mutable signs. So the quarter moon and mutable signs like this always indicates that there's a, like a crisis point. Things are coming to a head. There's actions being taken with. It tends to put like the the underscore underneath the sentence, but outside of that quarter moon by itself doesn't actually do that much in his chart that I can see right off the top of my head. There are more uh, telling things to, that are giving us information here. So if you look right here. 
we've got this big old honking T-square in cardinal signs right here. So we've got a Venus-Saturn opposition with Mars and Aries to the leg. I'm not a fan of this whole, like the whole Aries thing, you gotta be careful with the, the cardinal signs, in particular, uh, Cancer, Capricorn, Aries. Libra is a little bit different because it's a bridge sign, um, which makes sense to me, I'll explain someday. But for right now, you need to know, with the cardinal signs, uh, typically what you have are people who are very, um, invested in homogeny they prefer and like things that look like themselves so this is not to say that people with cardinal signs are going to be racist but it is to say that people who have a heavy emphasis of cardinal signs tend to be more comfortable or desirous of surrounding themselves with people that look like them okay um, and then of course they want to be the best of whoever's in a group so whatever their group is they want to be the best looking most powerful whatever it's just a weird sort of thing so while Chiron has been in Aries, we have had nothing but problems with toxic masculinity, okay? As well as, you know, this huge, huge flare up of overwhelming racism, um, you know, th this replacement theory, like, oh my God. Anyway, so thank God we're out of that. We've got, a, we've got better issues. What is it? Bigger fish and better issues to work with right now. Okay, but this is what we had at the time of the shooting. Now, one of the things that's important to note about this particular T-square, draw that back in here. So his planets are on the outside. Well, look over here. Remember, we don't have a time of birth for him. His moon and Mercury are both in late Capricorn. They are conjuncting Saturn and Pluto. And Saturn and Pluto take a long time to travel, which means that Saturn and Pluto have been all over his uh, very personal sensitive planets, Moon and Mercury, for quite some time. Now, with Moon-Saturn conjunctions, or with Saturn crossing your Moon, there's tend to be a more pessimistic, negative, or depressive outlook, um, or a more pragmatic one. Um, although people who are depressed or negative will often think they are being pragmatic. Pluto crossing the Moon will also indicate deep, deep internal changes and, tr and transform transformative experiences and self-reflection, uh, self-introspection, uh, um, like literally taking a good hard look at yourself that is required to get through this passage successfully. Saturn and Pluto together is a very cool combination. Saturn and Pluto together on the moon would indicate that this is somebody who may have in the two or three years uh, leading up to this shooting had been deeply unhappy and deeply pessimistic and very, very vulnerable to anyone that could offer him anything that would make him feel better and more important. Because also with a Saturn-Pluto conjunction like this crossing the moon, there's a tendency to feel like you're, you are devalued, like you don't mean anything, like you're not amounting to anything. I'm, I'm very curious now, now that I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about it, I'm very curious where this boy's father is or has been, because that would have played a huge, I would think, um, have been a huge factor in some of this depression, you know, in this, this sense of unworthiness, right? Being a loser in life or not being good enough for something to even to earn, you know, support and affection, right? And, and looking for guidance, which clearly he didn't have if his mother, oh my God, his mama drove him to the protest so he could kill people. Like if that's your like guidance in life, you're clearly really in a bad way. Wow. I mean, I'm not fond of him, but at the same time, under the circumstances, I feel bad for him too, because Jesus, this was his mother. I'm just saying. Anyway, <laughs> Saturn and Pluto would also have been all over his Mercury. Um, and so the thing with him, he's got Mercury retrograde Capricorn and some other stuff with this Mercury. He's not a bright boy. I, this is not a kid who's ever going to enter a gifted and talented program, um, which is also going to contribute to insecurity is about worth and value especially in a world where we're moving towards much more high technology stuff people who are not academically inclined and people who are more suited to hands-on work as opposed to like mental work uh really are feeling because we're in a transitional period right now are really feeling at a loss to find a valued place in the world because so much of this is going to like you know computers and whatnot i mean i struggle with technology i'm not much better so I know how um, 
how devaluing this can feel when you're just completely overwhelmed by what other people make look super easy and simple, right? 90 year old grandmothers can figure out how to work their cell phone and I can't. So with Saturn and Pluto crossing at Mercury, this is also going to contribute to this deep, deep sense of concern and worry, you know, that he doesn't have a place in, in the world in the future. So all of these things together are not creating a picture at the time of the shooting of somebody who was in a really good mental or emotional place. And this would have been leading up to this. So this is not like he woke up one day or last week and was depressed. This is something that's been building for a couple of years with these particular aspects. Now, if you'll notice, Jupiter kind of, I'm sorry, it's really thick. I don't have anything. I don't have a thin marker here. Use this one. So Jupiter is right here and Jupiter is approaching Saturn and Pluto. So typically we often like to look for exact aspects, right? So we're looking for something that's going to exactly hit. So we would normally just on fair assumption, look for this Jupiter to be exact on top of that Saturn and Pluto, which is not, but Jupiter has a wide orb, so we can still use it and you're still going to feel it. It is, however, being triggered, activated by Venus here at 18 Cancer. So Jupiter is moving into almost exact opposition with that Venus. Mm -mm, excuse me. And it has just passed his sun over here and also his Chiron is at 10. So he's, yes, yeah, see, I wonder where his dad is at. So he's got a sun Chiron conjunction at 10, 13 Capricorn over here. Jupiter's at 17. So Jupiter would have crossed sun and Capricorn uh maybe like a week or so earlier so if everything leading up to this particular moment in time there's the indication that this is something that's been that was building and being planned for in advance this wasn't him suddenly waking up you know or deciding after dinner that night you know mom i think i want to take my semi-automatic rifle and go shoot innocent people like it it wasn't that kind of impulse this was thought about um and like a fire stoked right stoked and 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 built up and, and built up and built up which is unfortunate. Now, just a little note here. With the sun, con sun conjunct Chiron in Capricorn, remember we don't have a time of birth for this kid. And also he's got the moon and Mercury and Mercury retrograde in Capricorn. With the sun and Chiron conjunct in Capricorn, uh, male authority and power is very important to him. So uh, this is not to say that he's gonna grow up to be a jerk. He could have easily turned out to be anybody else given the right parenting in different circumstances. Unfortunately, this is you know the life he's, he's having. So uh, what this also means is that he would have by nature a very high esteem and admiration for male authority figures um, because there's a deep wound here that has a lot to do with masculinity, masculine identity, fatherhood and patriarchy right all those things about being a man in the world and your place in it his entire life would have been spent struggling with these issues so if he had not done this he could have easily been somebody who's in and out of um court with criminal convictions for domestic violence right you know or you know pick a hundred other things uh but his father and all men who are in positions of authority would have been something that would have had a very special appeal and influence over him um which also means that they could have easily um, had they contributed in better ways, they could have easily prevented this from happening. So that's kind of sad too. So if you know people who have sun, sun Chiron conjunctions in their chart, understand that male authority, masculine authority, the, the father, paternus, um, in situations and in life are extremely uh, sensitive issues for them and they're very vulnerable to those influences so make sure they are surrounded by good men who are not uh, just wallowing in toxic masculinity that are going to lead them you know down the wrong path because Jesus we don't need more murderers right or wife beaters all right so there's that let's get rid of that and there was one other thing I wanted to point out here so, so far, what we have just really, and this is just literally a, a fast look at chart. I'm literally just now looking at the charts I'm getting it to you. So there, there may be things I'm missing. Um, but this, look, here, we're getting plenty of information here. Uh, so we're getting a picture of so somebody who has been depressed or very pessimistic, very um, insecure about their place and value in society. Somebody who's also very vulnerable and susceptible 
to the guidance or the the messages that he receives from old older male authorities or older male figures who could be potentially uh, big brother or uncles or father figures in his life because clearly there's issues with his own father and since we don't hear anything about his actual father there's there's now there's some question about where his father has been and for how long he's been missing from the kid's life so there's that and i would wonder who this child has been spending time around uh, that have been acting as father figures to him and giving him masculine guidance uh, which is an issue and you know he's not been in the best way right and this has been going on for a couple of years this has been building there's nothing sudden here now we know neptune and we're talking about my favorite planet neptune we know neptune has been in pisces for a while right and neptune gets such a bad rap i'm so tired of neptune getting a bad rap <laughs> you know it's escapism and it's drugs and it's lies and it's delusion and all of these things are potentially true but there's a deeper understanding of it we have to get to to make the best use of this planet so neptune is in its rulership in pisces but what it has also been doing look at this it has been squaring his Saturn in Gemini. So again, he's got Mercury retrograde in Capricorn. He's got a couple of other things going on that do not give an indication of this being a very bright boy. There may actually be some intellectual deficits or learning disabilities specific to him. Um, he may have average to below average intelligence. I'm not saying this to be a jerk. I'm saying this because this is a very real consideration with this chart. And if that is the case, would certainly uh, lend itself to a lot of anxiety and concern moving forward into a highly sophisticated technological world. It would totally make sense, right? Um, and all those things kind of feed into each other. So, because we're trying to paint a picture and understand where this kid is coming from. So Neptune, right here, Neptune in its rulership in Pisces squaring that Saturn in Gemini is going to lend itself to a lot of confusion and a lot of um, muddled thinking, right? And also with Saturn Neptune, anxiety tends to go through the ceiling because Neptune is all about the unseen, the unspoken um, and possibilities and, you know, these visions and dreams of the future, right? Because Neptune rules dreams and visions and imagination and saturn are the things that make us insecure and keep us awake at night right and make us nervous so with a saturn neptune square anybody with a saturn neptune square as if they've got it by transit right where saturn is squaring neptune but no more if anybody has saturn in gemini right now with neptune on their transiting neptune on their saturn they're going to be struggling with a lot of anxiety because our imagination is going to be working overtime. There's a lot of muddled thinking and there's a tendency to lean more heavily towards more pessimistic, you know, nihilistic uh, kinds of outcomes when we, when we consider possibilities. Um, so they need to be handled gently um, and very sensitively because they're the, the chimeras that keep them awake at night, right? And give them insomnia and, and, and make them scared. Also do it in such a way because Saturn in Gemini doesn't articulate things well. Um, does it in such a way that it's hard for them to express exactly what it is they're afraid of, which makes it even harder to get the support they need to put those anxieties to rest so they can be functional. So this is the picture we have of Kyle Rittenhouse. And so far, none of these things necessarily lend themselves to attempted massacres, right? And this is a very important thing to also consider because astrology will not tell you the character of someone. And also the chart does not compel, it reflects. So if we, if you look at it this way and you take that chart and now you put that in the context of the environment he's growing up in, now it'll make a lot more sense. So the environment's growing up in, I mean, he's in Illinois, I think. Um, these are very white bread nannies and white potato areas. Um, and it's a lot of farming, right? A lot of farm and farmland, a lot of rur rural, I can never say that word rural <laughs> uh, area um, where, you know, the, the technological directions we are heading in could easily and very well be very overwhelming for the younger generation coming up because a lot of the farm work 
you know, is being done more efficiently with robotics. Obviously, machinery makes things, especially, you know, basic not thinking work, right, uh, faster and, and easier. Um, so, you know, the kids are left with what, right? So there's there's not a lot of options if you don't know how to do computers or deal with software and all this sort of stuff, which isn't to say that these people are stupid. This has everything to do with the fact that you're working in or living in an environment that's a very homogenous or similar environment to the areas around it, right? It's a very limited function type of environment. So rural areas are there specifically to do the things that give us life, which is produce food. I'll take food over a computer any day, well, some days, most days. <laughs> the internet's pretty important to me, so I don't know. Um, but we need food, we need to be able to eat. These are life-giving, life-sustaining things. So they have tremendous value. But the problem is the people who who manage these, these areas, who manage these lands, who produce these foods, are now in with the rest of us in transition into a more technologically sophisticated world. So we're farm families used to need to have either slaves or 20 kids to help work the farm. You're not going to work a farm, you know, as a couple with a childless couple, because at some point you're going to get too old to do this stuff. You're going to need kids to take over, right? Which is why farm families historically had very large families, um, not necessarily because of lack of birth control, but just because it's the smart, practical thing to do. Ask any farm family in other parts of the globe. So, We've got machinery now that's doing all that. So those those extra hands are not as necessary and critical as they used to be. Now we need people who can um, do more with technology. So the other side of that is that unless you live in an area where you are surrounded by people who are constantly engaged in this stuff, like working with different software programs or working with computers or stuff, you are limited to the information you're going to have available to you to pick this information up and learn it and master it faster. If you have ever tried to, uh, and I'm gonna give you a perfect example, right? So if you've ever tried to learn how to use software, like I'm trying to learn how to use video editing software. So the thing about it is video editing software, like it looks like a console for the inside of an airplane. Dear God. So kids, anybody under 30, <laughs> will often say to me, oh, you just have to play with it. Well, no, I'm not gonna just play with it. That's not how that works. And you can go to YouTube and watch videos to kind of sort of figure it out. But here's the problem. When you watch a video, you can't ask it a question, right? So it will take you 10 times longer to figure out how to learn something from a video because you've got to do all this research to get an answer to a simple question like, wait a minute, how did you end up on this screen? My screen doesn't look like that. What just happened? Whereas if you have peers around you that are all involved in the same things, you can turn to your left, turn to your right, or pick up a phone and call somebody and say, dude, like I've got this thing happening. Do you know what this is? And they can give you the answer like that. In larger, more um, urban or metropolitan areas, you've got more bodies and more kids surrounded with each other. So they're able to access uh, this information from each other faster, which means that it facilitates their learning and mastery of technology even faster, smoother, and easier. When you are living in a more isolated environment because you live in an area where you're just not surrounded by younger people, right, that you can call on the phone and say, dude, what's this about? Like, explain this to me. Or you're living, for instance, out in a rural area where it's same thing, people are very spread out. Your neighbors in a rural, rural, <laughs> area are not next door. Next door in the country is like a mile or more down the road. So people are far more spread out. There's less of them. So there's less opportunity to, to access information except through very specific limited sources such as the internet or what your instructor is able to give you if they can give you anything. This puts people out in the country or in rural areas uh, at a disadvantage, you know, so this will absolutely like make people more anxious and it's the same thing in urban environments i suppose um but ultimately this is this is what we're dealing with right so kyle uh is a product not just of his chart kyle is a product of his environment so with him one of the things that i would look for also too given what we're seeing here is what type of environment is this kid growing up in that this kind of general hatefulness for people you don't even know, for principles that have nothing to do with anything that's gonna hurt you, like where is this coming from? 
right? So the adults are largely responsible for Kyle becoming a murderer and potentially, if justice prevails, going to prison for this. So he doesn't do it again. So this is the this is a chart of the shooting itself. So the inside of the chart is the shooting, or I'm sorry, the natal. The, the inside of the chart is his natal chart. Remember, we don't have houses because we don't know what time he was born. The progressed planets for him are in green, and the transits at the time of the shoot, or yeah, the transits at the time of the shooting are all here. Progressions and transits are all here, and the, the transits are in red. So one of the things you're going to look at, because you know, with astrology, we're always looking for patterns, right? So it's never an isolated aspect. There's patterns here. We need a like a literally like a car crash, you know, a multi-car pileup for, for something to manifest and, and become physically existent in the world. Um, or we need a different chart to look at. <laughs> anyway, one of the things you're going to notice right here, like look at this, this heavy, heavy emphasis right here with Jupiter, Pluto, Saturn by transit and the sun, uh, skip the midhaven because we don't have time of birth, all on his moon Mercury. Right. So now remember, we talked about his moon Mercury being very depressed, you know, and feeling very vulnerable and all that happy stuff uh, that that's just not great. Right. So right there, uh, this would because it's the moon and Mercury, this would indicate that this particular shooting is very emotionally motivated. Now, we know his mother was there. She drove him there, dropped him off and drove the car back. Like what kind of sick mother does this? But that's a whole other conversation. So right there is some emotional uh, investment and support, especially because if your mother's telling you son, this is a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do. You should do it. Like, no, we assume that our mother wants what, what's best for us, especially when you're his age, right? And you don't have a father because clearly nobody knows where his father is. He's never mentioned. So there's that. But it could also be with this deep emotional investment for him, that uh, there are environmental factors because Mercury rules neighbors, right? And the moon rules the people, general people around you in the local area. So this could also be literally friends and neighbors around him that were also uh, very supportive or that he was seeking the approval of mm, um, that drove this action. So there's more here than him just deciding one day to pick up a gun and, you know, go murder people. There's, there's a lot of external influence here. Um, that's feeding into that. Now, with his chart, what's interesting also, too, I want to bring your attention to this. He's got a Venus-Mars conjunction in Scorpio. It's making a wide square to Jupiter um, and, again, a square to Uranus. So we've got a wide T-square here. Let me show you. Oh, let me use the bigger one. So with Venus and Mars together, Anytime you have Venus and Mars together in a conjunction, it can be problematic because Venus and Mars together, uh, and I've, I've never seen this not be true, they're very good at getting their own needs met. They're not great at meeting other people's needs. So there's that. Um, they're very selfish in that way. It's very self-absorbed. And it's, it's, uh, there's a hyper-sexualization with a Venus-Mars conjunction, which is good if that's what you want in a relationship. It's bad if you just want to be platonic friends because they, they can't, they, they just can't. Um, now, with Venus and Mars and Scorpio, Venus is in its fall, uh, or, or its detriment. Venus is weak, it's in its fall. Venus does not like being in Scorpio. Scorpio, the sign Scorpio warps and, and deforms Venus. It makes it difficult for Venus, Venus to express its healthier side. Mars and Scorpio, Mars in its natural rulership in Scorpio, which makes the Mars and Scorpio placement the dominant party in this, this partnership between Venus and Mars. So Venus and Mars together in Scorpio would indicate somebody who's very sexually driven um, and always with these damn guns. Like this is like the world's biggest phallic symbol. Like I'm going to whip out my phallic symbol and I'm going to injure you with it to establish my dominance. Anyway, <laughs> so Venus and Mars together in Scorpio, there's a, a, a tremendous amount of sexual energy involved in this. So I'm curious, because he's not the most attractive kid either, um, if he was not also sexually frustrated and some of this was trying to uh, elevate his masculine points to the opposite sex to make him more desirable as an alpha male. Right? I wouldn't be surprised if they did some, if you actually did some search on this kid, if he didn't also belong to these uh, incel groups or these uh, MRAs or uh, MGTOWs or the, um, 
oh my god, the the, pick, the PUAs, right? Or even like the anti, well, they're all anti-feminist, but like the whole hateful, you know, women are my property and should should succumb to my needs, you know, kind of thing. One of those groups. I would be really surprised if he wasn't involved in those on top of everything else. Now, sorry, but I digress. So let's go over here. So this T-square involves Jupiter and Uranus. Well, what does that mean, Spanky? So here's the thing, with that Venus-Mars conjunction in T-square with Jupiter and Uranus, there's also the indication that there are strong homoerotic uh, impulses that he may or may not be comfortable with. Um, certainly some unorthodox or non-traditional or non-conformist sexual predilections uh, that he may or may not have been uh, open about expressing. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the speculation of this because there's nowhere good to go with us with his particular chart. Uh, what I will say is that with Jupiter and Uranus in opposition to each other like this, people with Jupiter and Uranus in opposition tend to be much more creative uh, and they also tend to be a lot more experimental um, as well as they tend to have uh, tastes and interests and preferences that are uniquely their own. They're not necessarily bad things, um, but they're certainly not run of the mill, lights out, sheets on top, you know, let's not look each other in the eye and you've got 10 minutes go. <laughs> With Venus and Mars um, as part of this T-square, this makes it more complicated because remember, Venus is warped and deformed being in Scorpio. Mars is in its rulership on top of Venus, totally dominating the partnership. So this Mars and Scorpio runs this ship. Mars and Scorpio in T-square with that Jupiter Uranus means that the sex drive would be um, would blink on and off. So he would go from periods of being hypersexual to hyper celibate. Also with Mars in a T-square with Jupiter and Uranus, um, he, he's going to have difficulty. He would have difficulty no matter what as he goes through life. He would have difficulty having uh, satisfying relationships with people because he invariably would over sexualize or hyper sexualize his encounters with people. And if you were dealing with women, I, I don't know about men, maybe men feel differently about this with other men, but if you're dealing with heterosexual women, they don't want you, you know, sticking your wang in their face all the time. Like, for the love of God, man, put your penis away. Um, women need that that quiet lull in relationships they don't want everything to be about sex all the time so the problem with him is that he's literally on or off so it's either hypersexual mode or nothing at all like you're frozen out like like you, you don't exist and he's off doing whatever with his buddies like he never had a relationship with you so no matter what he was going to have problems in his relationships um with women you know moving forward so there's that Ugh. Now, uh, and also we covered that Saturn-Pluto opposition, right? So, yeah, and the mother, man, I, this woman, I don't know where her birth information is, and I don't really know if I want to give her um, a lot of time actually looking into it, but the, the relationship with the mother is toxic, man, totally toxic. So I'm wondering how much of his relationship with her also plays into this dysfunctional uh, relationship patterns with women uh, as he goes on in life. So, so there's that. Now, also at the time of this shooting, Venus was approaching Pluto and that Saturn-Pluto opposition. Venus approaching Pluto is going to make him popular with the masses. Um, and we know, because we talked about Jupiter and Aquarius being all over that, um, his chart at the time of the trial, or right now, um, that he is in fact popular with some groups of people, which is kind of odd and not the best groups of people we would want to be popular with. What are you going to do, right? All right, so, and the last thing I want to bring your attention to is his progressed moon right here. It literally just entered Virgo. Sorry, giant circle. <laughs> Um, so the progressed moon in Virgo, uh, you know, and it's difficult to use this because we don't know what house it's in and it's not making any tight aspects. Um, but what we do know is the progressed moon in Virgo is, as we speak now, making a trine or applying to a trine with the sun in Chiron. So I would imagine the missing father that nobody ever talks about may reappear or resurface. Um, but certainly there are 
male mentors and men in positions of authority that are going to appear now um, to fill in that that gaping wound uh, in his psyche in terms of you know modeling manhood now whether these are positive or negative models I, we don't know we don't know we can only hope for the best right um, but they are certainly going to be there and stepping in the thing about it is when this progressed moon moves past that right it will then move into oops shoot let me read that it's going to move into a trine with this complicated there's something here and i did have a chance to look up the decadence of the lots but there's something here with this moon mercury right so the moon will move into that a trine with the moon mercury but at the same time what it's also going to do is it's going to square saturn and it's going to square pluto so when the moon, progressed moon gets down to the late degrees of virgo which will take a few years um yes a year or so it's it's a little bit later but when it gets down there one of the things that we would look for is the very distinct possibility uh it, it it's not great um so there will be some or a lot of taking care of him or or uh, in like infirm care like taking care of him because he's sick or or in pain um with this <clears throat> with this t-square that gets sets up between pluto saturn and this progressed moon that is not so so good so even if even if he gets off by technicality or mistrial right and does not go to prison or goes to G prison for a very short amount of time like literally a super like insultingly lean or minimal sentence right it's not over because when this moon gets into two degrees with that saturn pluto because saturn and pluto together are the karmic planets when the mo progress moon moves into exact aspect with those karma will be served even if justice is not and saturn and pluto as a rule are very cruel combinations of planets um so it's either cruelty that we inflict on other people or cruelty that is inflicted upon us by other people in either event it's not uh i, I wouldn't wish that on anybody um even him in spite of the fact that he's a murderer because honestly like he is as much a product of his environment as he is you know who he is by cosmology so yeah here we go so to recap kyle rittenhouse is a teenager who drove across state lines or was driven across state lines by his mommy uh, with a semi-automatic weapon to go to a black lives matter protest to shoot protesters um and while he was there he literally walked past the police who were there at the protest to prevent anything bad from happening because you know ooh, those protesters are so bad um and they watched him walk up and they you know high-fived him and gave him a bottle of water as he walked away like literally it, it's just the if you are not familiar with this case go back and read the news reports about it because it is a horrifying statement about you know the united states and also the mentality of the farmland out there you know and and what they consider normal and what they consider threatening so um kyle's trial is happening now as we speak let's keep an eye on it and see how things go i don't think this is going to go anywhere i think the fix was in before the trial started i think the trial is just a giant dog and pony show to satisfy the public it's all theater um, and I think that it's either going to be a mistrial because of technicalities or somebody's going to challenge it and try to and successfully overturn it. Um, but this will not go forward the way it should. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, I could have this completely backwards, but I don't think so. So we'll see. And just to uh, finish this video and to to remind us all what we're dealing with here, this is Kyle Written Kyle Rittenhouse's mother on the left. Her name is Wendy Rittenhouse. She's a nursing assistant out in Illinois, right? Which is a hotbed of KKK activity, by the way, if you're not familiar. Um, and this is Kyle. This He's a kid. Jesus, he is a kid, you know? And she encouraged and supported and abetted his entry into a protest in another state just so he could go murder people. So we can talk about toxic manhood all we want, right? And the, you know, the, the patriarchy, um, because there are definitely issues with that. But at the end of the day, we cannot 
uh, turn a blind eye to the powerful uh, impact and influence that toxic motherhood can have as well. So racism is taught. We're not born like that. It's taught to us. Hatred is not a family value. Have a good day, folks.